Well, you can look around and see it is beautiful. It is a beautiful piece of the mother load. It's a great place to live, but there are some social and economic problems. Well, I mean, traditionally, people who live in the Blue Mountain area are fiercely independent. If you're constantly moving from one place to another because of a boom bust cycle, uh, it, it, it's very difficult to create community with that kind of uh, situation. People needed something that they could believe in again because they had been down for so long. The Blue Mountain residents have been working for quite some time on some pretty tough issues. We wanted to find out how UC Davis could support their efforts and what we might learn from the experience. My name is Arveda Fisher. I'm the granddaughter of Manuel Jeff and Eva Jeff. I'm Northern Sierra Miwok. I lived in Calaveras County all my life. This is the Blue Mountain region of Calaveras County. It is the home of 2,500 residents. They spread throughout the four communities, Glencloe, Railroad Flat, West Point, and Wilseyville. When the Europeans came into the area and the gold rush began, that's when we really saw many, many changes, drastic changes. The Miwok people were more scattered. Everything was taken over. Even the land where the native people used to be able to roam freely and go gather their plants and do their hunting. Now there was fences up or there was gold claims private property. The gold rush was not a good thing, I don't believe, in this area. You can see where beautiful trees just stand there, grandfather trees, and that's all gone. And that was taken away, you know, those things you will never bring back. So it changed the face of the mother load in many ways. This is Blue Mountain, the highest point in, of this region right here. Top of Blue Mountain is about 5,100 feet. My name is Alan Willard. Uh, my father was a timber faller and a lumber mill worker and uh, just lived here all my life. When the miners came to California, they, they needed houses and um, they needed stores and all this stuff, of course, is going to be, be made out of lumber. So the lumber industry picked up along with gold mining. The definition, I guess, of a mother load is, is a vein of gold that goes into a creek. And well, if you can find the vein, then you can find lots of gold. When all the veins play out, then they shut the mine and that's it. It's bust. When World War II came along, a lot of those little mills, along with the small mines, they closed down. In the 1980s, another boom happened. Uh, large industries came in and they had very big operations and they wanted to make a lot of money as fast as they could. So they pulled as much logs out of the forest as they could possibly pull out of the forest. Over the years after having um, hiked up and down these hills and discovered just marvelous places, I've, I've come to really, really love the natural environment here. My name is Katrine Lambie and I'm currently the director of the Blue Mountain Coalition for Youth and Families in downtown West Point. People live um, in the woods, they're far away from each other. There's no real town center. 
Um, there's no public transportation. Oftentimes, people don't have a lot of money for gas. They stay away from each other. There is no way to bring people together. People are isolated. It's a, it's a very big barrier. And that's why um, the role of the Blue Mountain Coalition for Youth and Families in West Point, I think, is so important in that it uh, gives a physical place to create community. I own a local newspaper here, the West Point News. It's a monthly community newspaper and really focuses on what the community is all about. My name is Rick Torgerson. I live in West Point. I've been a full-time resident here for about 10 years. I quit the corporate world in the Bay Area and just decided to move up here full-time. I, I didn't move here to be engaged in the community. I moved, I moved here and then discovered the community and then became engaged in it. We have people here living in such extreme poverty that you wouldn't know that you were in California or you wouldn't know you were in the Sierra if you see some of the things that are going on here. When most people think of the Sierra Nevada, they think of the beautiful forests and rivers, the wilderness areas, Lake Tahoe, Yosemite, maybe the giant sequoias. What they don't often think about are all the small rural communities that are spread out across that mountain range that are really struggling with social and economic change. My name is Jessica Maria Ross, and I direct the new Art of Regional Change program at UC Davis. The Art of Regional Change brings together scholars, students, artists with community organizations to collaborate on community story projects. And the goal of the projects is really about contributing to ground level community development efforts. I started getting involved in the Blue Mountain area because I had been working in the Sierra Nevada and I had heard about this grassroots community renewal movement and I was intrigued. I wanted to learn more about it. People around here started to notice that the boom, the boom bus cycle was really fragmenting our community and we realized that uh, we weren't going to be pulled out of this economic quagmire by Sierra Pacific or the state of California or the federal government or anyone like that. It had to be, it had to be here, it had to be homegrown. In 1999, someone said that I should go to a meeting and it had to do with uh, community renewal. Maybe we could actually do something for ourselves and, and decide, well, what is our vision for our community? Our community? What, what do we want to see here? Nobody had asked that question before on a large scale. The initial meetings were yelling matches and then we walked through that and I think there was a time at some meeting that I was uh, attending people were actually talking to each other and I think that that's for me that what that is what stands out is that finally we were done with the yelling the posturing and we were actually talking to each other and we had well, two or three little meetings in the youth center and then there were so many people started to come. We had to, we graduated to the church, which had more room. The meetings changed from the church to community hall because at one point uh, there was a couple hundred people. Uh, there are people from many different walks of life up here. People that have moved into the area, people that have been here forever, people that are uh, natives, uh, their families have been here for thousands of years. Uh, there's pioneer families, uh, minor families. If you include everybody, what, what is the list of things that you're gonna decide you want for your community? All those kinds of questions came up. The room was covered with uh, big post-it sheets with write-ups and coming up with strengths and needs and wishes and taking stock of what was in the community, what was needed in the community, and what could uh, realistically happen, and also a timeline. I think that there was a sense of belonging. Yes, this could be a community and a viable community, and perhaps we could actually get along. It made a lot of people realize that working together we could accomplish something and that there was actually other people interested enough to become involved to help us accomplish a change in our community. Uh, 
to try to reverse this trend of losing our jobs and losing the community and having the community just fragment. Looking back, I think that the best outcome was that a sense of potential community was born there and that a group of very diverse people, including Native people, um, could actually think of themselves as a community. And I think that, that that planted many seeds for things that we've seen happen in this community later on. Well, you know, while the university may seem like a world away from the rural Sierra, there's a connection that actually might surprise you. Like the folks up in the Blue Mountain region, scholars at UC Davis are also really trying to figure out how to best sustain rural communities. I had heard that the Blue Mountain residents had gone through a community visioning process and laid out a number of revitalization projects sometime back in the late 90s. But community revitalization, it takes a long time, and I had heard that Romentum had dissipated. So it seemed like an ideal moment for the university and community to partner on a project through the Art of Regional Change. So what we did is we put together a project with the Blue Mountain Coalition for Youth and Families. It had three core parts. The first was to invite scholars to participate in the project to really help us think through how stories could be made and used for change. The second was to invite students to be involved to help create a community video project. And the third, which was really the focus, was to bring a group of rural youth together with community leaders over about four months to create digital stories that really celebrated and profiled the different community revitalization efforts that have been happening over the past decade. The stories could then be used to help the Blue Mountain residents raise awareness of what they were doing, why it was important, and how other people could get involved. Many people in the West Point area know me as the fix-it gal. I'm always wanting to repair something that is broken or make something prettier. I found my niche in the Community Revive and Relief project. Revive and Relief began as a downtown beautification project. We hoped that by helping people clean up, paint, and relief by planting trees and flowers, they would feel pride in the community and setting where they lived. In 2003, I heard about a grassroots group that was getting together to protect the Upper McCullumy River watershed. So I jumped at the chance to join that group. We monitor the river for all kinds of things, kind of like a doctor checkup. We do all the cool scientific stuff like measuring dissolved oxygen, turbidity, electrical conductivity, and pH. And we look for problem spots. And it's fun! We called the project up from the understory because when you drive up to the Sierra Nevada, what you usually notice are these tall, beautiful trees, the forest canopy. But what makes that overstory possible is really what's going on underneath, what ecologists call the understory. And the thing about the understory is that it doesn't have the same access to light or water. So the plants have to be much more creative and resourceful in order to really survive and thrive. And to us, that was really a metaphor for what was happening in the Blue Mountain region. It was really a way of saying how the residents were coming together and really being creative in terms of coming up with homegrown solutions to their local challenges. In District 2, we found there are only two kinds of people, folks who are trying to make it a better world and those who aren't. Our job is to organize the former, and here's how it works. Unlikely allies like Native Americans, environmental activists, and loggers form the CHIPS project and put people back to work, making healthier forests, and keeping seniors fire safe. We finally stopped defining each other by our differences and started to find out that we all have at least one thing in common. We love this spectacular place and the communities we live in. We're now trying to plan for our future, 
trying to agree on a plan to protect our rural lifestyle while helping bring essential services to our community. We've held community meetings with more than 100 people attending, where we've agreed on development principles, established planning boundaries, conducted community surveys, and other planning tasks. Coming to agreement is difficult, but we are practicing democracy at the grassroots level. We don't care about malls and wide roads with stoplights. We just want to see people earn a decent living and work together for a strong, healthy community. When I'm in the roundhouse, watching the dancers in their regalia, it makes me feel proud that they're still keeping our culture around and they're having a great time doing it. You could see everyone's expression of excitement or happiness on their faces. It feels good with all your family and friends sharing a good time with people from our community and other communities. It also helps share our culture with everyone in the community. It's through telling stories that people understand themselves and the world around them. You know, stories draw on memory and imagination. They create public history. They help people bond. You know, I think that stories are really catalysts for change. They help people understand an issue from a different perspective. They put a face on an issue. They help you understand that issue in a different way, and they motivate you to get involved. Well, in addition to the digital stories that the youth produced, we decided that we needed um, some history to contextualize their stories. The community advisory group that I was working with felt that we needed something as a companion piece. So they worked together with UC Davis students and faculty to make a video that told a broader public history of the area. I'm Julie Wyman, I'm a documentary filmmaker and an assistant professor in the Technocultural Studies program here at UC Davis. So I brought my video production class into this project and what we did was we worked with local residents to script and shoot and edit a short video that told the, the history, like the social and economic history of the region. We put my students' project together with the youth-produced videos and gave them back to the community so that they could continue to be used in the revitalization efforts. Well, for my part in the End of Story project, a colleague of mine, Ryan Galt, and I uh, went up to Calaveras and held a mapping workshop in which we talked about some of the new technologies that are available for communities to put their concerns to the forefront my name is Michael Zeiser. I'm assistant professor of English here at UC Davis, where I study literature and the environment. Uh, a big part of that is, is looking into how people think and write about the places that they live. For a long time, maps were one-way kinds of media. But now, with new kinds of technology, people who live in the area that's being mapped can talk back to the map. Uh, and so our purpose was to talk to folks about some of the technologies that were available to do that and also some of the potential you know, power or relative equity that it can bring to a community. I think the people who came to this evening didn't have any idea what it was going to be about mapping. But I think they found it very engaging and it actually generated an interesting discussion uh, among us, among ourselves. Uh, you know, well, what? What would we put on a map and what would we um, want to point out? After we produced the stories, we put them together onto a DVD and the young people from the Blue Mountain area organized two community screenings where they presented their work. You know, I will never forget the screening up in the Blue Mountain area. The young people showed all of the stories they facilitated a two-hour dialogue with adults. And you got this kind of intergenerational conversation going about what mattered to people locally, what they wanted to do about it, and you could see how using stories was a springboard for having that really important discussion. 
the children, the kids, the young adults who participated um, did go to UC Davis. They were honored at UC Davis, which also was a, uh, an experience that uh, none of them had ever had. Their families went to UC Davis, and that also was a great field trip. I think it was an affirmation in many ways for them. It meant a lot to them, right, to be uh, recognized by the university. Universities are kind of um, centers of prestige and authority in our culture, and uh, to, to have the university take a real interest in what they're doing, um, and not just land in their community to take some data and run off, uh, I, I think has to mean a lot to them. And I could see it on you know, the faces of the, the adults and the, and the younger people when they came to Davis for um, the screening of the, of the documentary that they had made together. The project impacted the, um, the community in many ways. It impacted the, the kids who were involved in the project directly. They learned many skills. They learned to work in a group. They learned to start carry out and finish a project. They did that, which is something that they don't often experience. They met new people. They got to know their community better. They learned some things they did not know about this community. My students got a lot out of this project. It was a great experience for them. But the, the really amazing thing that they got, what I noticed was that at a certain point, they, by collaborating in this community storytelling project, they were able to see themselves as participants. They were actually contributing back to this revitalization movement. As a scholar, I got a lot of things to think about that have really, I think, made my own research more sophisticated. I, uh, uh, and that's, that's something that's going to pay dividends for me for a long time. And I know that I have other colleagues whose work would also benefit from this kind of experience. For us as an organization, it certainly awakened us to the fact that this was a very fruitful and potentially deep way to collaborate with a university that's far away. And traditionally, we had always um, looked at the um, university as this entity way out there that really didn't have anything to do with us. Part of what the University of California is for and the real reason that the people of California uh, partially subsidize it is that it's dedicated to solving and thinking through the problems that actually afflict Californians, right? And that we could actually, you know, focus on a relatively small community that's a few hours away from our main campus and help them do something that they wanted to do, which was to be able to articulate a community voice and get it out to other people uh, in the region is, uh, I think, you know, absolutely what the, what the university was founded to do. I think it's the, the willingness to collaborate that is the first step. And the willingness for the university to come out of the campus and into the community. Because the community going into the campus will always and forever be a very limited uh, partnership. Up From the Understory shows how rural people are working together to preserve their heritage, sustain the environment, and reboot their local economies. And it shows how universities can play a meaningful role in supporting locally driven efforts. It's why I think it's, it's a great model for other colleges and communities across California. Every community has, has it, its story. And um, we here in, the, in this community have come to realize that we are the ones in charge of, of making our story and we are creating our own up from the understory.